Um, if you do get questions, um, fire them in just as quick as you want. Uh, basically, tonight I'm going to talk about my personal history with wood turning first. Uh, that will take just a few minutes. Then I'll do a general tour of the workshop um, and then start talking about one or two pieces in general. But um, as you feel fit to ask questions, do as you please. Okay. Right. Um, this evening, I was going, well, un until last night, I was under the impression I was going to follow Andrew Hall. And I was going to introduce this piece with, well, you've seen the Lord Mayor, now comes the man with the broom. Um, so that's changed, so we shan't do that bit. Um, what I will say is, good evening to everybody. Uh, I don't think I've ever had quite as many people in this workshop as what we've got tonight. And you're more than welcome to see what I do. Uh, many see this place as a dusty, dirty, five meter by three meter garage. I see it as a home from home. And it's the first place my wife looks for me when, when she's on the hunt. Um, it's, it is just a garage. Uh, it's fully insulated on five sides and is only heated at the cold end in the winter. I have no other space allocated to me whatsoever. I can't store stuff outside. I don't have anywhere else. What, I, what you see here is what I've got and nothing else. Now, I've seen many demonstrations and workshop tours over the years, and I felt it was important to show, um, if we could, would-be turners, that they are not the only ones working in a small space or on a tight budget. Uh, compared with, <coughs> excuse me, compared with many, I work in a large, warm, comfy place, and I achieve lots of good things. We try. Compared with many others, I work in a tight cupboard. I have little ambition to move on, but I think it's important to appreciate and accept that the skill set that we have is vast, and we're all entitled to a rung on the ladder somewhere. So, um, having said that bit, my first attempts at wood turning were in, I think, 1963, uh, when I was at uh, senior school. Uh, I took wood, woodwork as an option as well, instead of metalwork. Um, so if you work, work back from 1963, I could claim I've been a wood turner for 57 years, I think it is. Um, it's not been quite long, because actually I had 43 years off. In, I think it was 2007, I started to think about what I was going to do when I retired from work. And my mind constantly went back to uh, the wood turning I did at school. Uh, I got a lot of pleasure from it. And I thought this is something that I could pursue during retirement. So I arranged a couple of professional training days with my local professional, Nick Arnold. Had a great time with Nick, uh, a lot of things. Uh, that was 13 years ago, and I still can't regularly remember some of the things that Nick told me. So he must have had a real mark on my memory. Um, on my website, I have said that Nick Arnold, you've started a fire in my brain. Um, it's really, it's never gone away. Uh, some might think so because of the limited range of stuff that I do, but I still get a huge amount of pleasure from wood turning. And um, I won't listen to anybody who wants to put that down. Um, well, uh, 2008 onwards, I joined many and various clubs. I enjoyed them all. I wrote lots of wood club um, newsletters, um, which taught me a lot. I watched, I listened, I learned, and I started to buy the equipment that I needed while I was still earning a wage to pay for it all. And then after some, a small number of years, I started demonstrating. 
and now I enjoy getting out to visit clubs and societies whenever I can um, to show, talk and turn. Um, it took me a good while to get into demonstrating because, it was, you know, like everybody, you feel reluctant to put yourself on the spot. And it took me a long time to appreciate what you have to do to demonstrate. Um, for me, it was understanding that you can demonstrate when you know how to do what you're doing on the lathe without having to think about it. Because at least then you can do the turning and you can talk to people. I've always enjoyed talking to people. So the moment I realized that, I found projects that I could do without having to hesitate or without having to think a great deal. And from that point onwards, I've always enjoyed demonstrating. So that was the, the turning point for me. Um, I'm going to start the basic tour of the workshop now. Um, but first, uh, I've got a gizmo that I want to show you. All of, all of my production starts here. Um, at the side of my lathe, I've got a small table uh, with lathe-based tool, the heavy, monger, heavy iron mongery. And all of my main production happens on this Jet 1642. Now, something that I have created for myself, I've never seen it anywhere before, is this. I thought it would be worth showing it you tonight. It is nothing more than a digital caliper. If I switch to that picture, you can see a, a top view and a side view of a digital, digital caliper. Um, now, it's had all of the measuring prongs put off. I mean, this caliper was a vast price on eBay. I think it was £3.49 or something stupid. So, you know, it's a complete chuck away item. This caliper has had all the measuring prongs cut off. And on the left end, you can see a small metal hook, uh, hook bracket. Now, I come back to here. This is the piece. This hook drops into the gap between the live center and the quill. And lo and behold, you get absolutely perfect measurement of drill depth or any other function on the tail stop. Um, actually, it winds backwards as well. Sometimes you have to re-register it, but the the principle is always good. You can get absolutely perfect drilling depth. Because a good deal of what I do involves drilling to a very specific depth. Um, as far as I know, I've invented it. I, I don't know of anyone who's done something similar. Um, if anybody has, fine. I didn't copy their idea. This is my idea. Um, but it's just very, really useful. Um, I'll take that away. And we will start the tour. Um, as, as things stand at the moment, this camera here, this is an Android telephone. It's just an ordinary um, Android uh, Samsung phone. Uh, and it's communicating with my PC in the corner through a piece of software called Droid Cam. And it just looks like any other camera to the software that we're using. Very useful. Anyway, if we look at here, you can see this is my working side of the workshop. Lots of storage for finishing goods. And if the camera would keep up, I'd be well away. 
this has been working fine all weekend, all week. Oops, yeah, there we go. For some reason tonight, the camera is, this, this phone camera is being a bit reluctant. I'll just stop and restart it. Bear with me for a moment. Yeah. All down uh, what I call the left side of the workshop. It's all finishing materials, sanding, polish, uh, paint, stain, whatever. I don't do much in the way of colouring and staining. Um, there we go. In the back of this picture, or halfway down, is um, one of my favourite machines. It's my um, Jet 2244 drum sander. Um, that does an awful lot of work for me. Um, and it was picked up for a song. Uh, on the top of the carriage, there's a big hand wheel for raising and lowering the drum. And the thread on that hand wheel is one millimeter. John, can you get a bit closer to the mic? You're sort of fading out. Can't get closer to the mic. I'm, it's on my collar. All right. Um, maybe, maybe I need to be closer to the receiver. How's that? Yeah, that sounds okay. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the drum sander does an awful lot of work for me. Um, the, the lead screw on the big rotary handle on the top left, uh, that's on a one millimetre thread. Uh, so one turn of the handle gives us one millimetre rise and fall on the head. And I can take it right down to one mil thickness, or I can go right up to four, uh, to a, a hundred mil, four inch. So very versatile, very valuable. Now I need to just turn the camera a little bit. My camera tonight is not, not playing games. Anyway, if you can see in the back right of that picture, um, there's a small Myford um, engineering lathe. Normally it's kept well sealed and well covered. Uh, keep the dust out of it. I've just uncovered it for tonight. Um, again, it does things for me. I don't use it much, um, but it's valuable. Now, I the drum sander, I got that for... A really cheap price because I went to my local carpenter's store, carpenter's workshop rather, and I was just asking him, what can you tell me about drum sanders? What do you want to know, he says. Um, so I said, uh, well, are they any good? Can you recommend any? And he said, well, what about looking at this one? And he showed me the machine you can see there. Um, and I said, oh, yes, very nice. What's what's the throat range? One mil to foot to a uh, hundred mil. Um, oh, oh, that would do me. And it's got a powered belt on it. And I said, how much is it? And he says, oh, 750 quid. And I gave a really sharp intake of breath. And I said, oh, that's much more than I can afford. And he said, oh. Have about 500. So I sort of bit his arm off and shook his hand, and um, the deal was done. Uh, so I think that was almost like the bargain of the century. And um, the, the Myford engineering lathe uh, was some, something similar. It was a really cheap, good buy because it 
came with lots and lots of tooling on its own stand. And both of these machines, I could sell them for mega money instantly if I had to. Uh, so there we go. Uh, just useful stuff. Now, I don't know why, but I can't get my camera to give you the pictures I want. Let me try restarting the camera. being on a stand I'm going to carry it very gently here's the myford lathe now buried in this corner oh that wall by any by the way is actually the up and over door for the garage uh, well sealed well insulated um, does the job buried in the corner small Axminster lathe uh, that goes out with me on demonstrations Axminster bandsaw sharpening and grinding this lamp uh, again um, a very useful machine um, uh, props on 250 mil uh, variable speed disc sander tall pillar drill floor standing pillar drill and we're back at techno corner for those that haven't seen it tonight, I am working with a piece of software called Touch Portal. Now, this is again a spare Android phone, and I can choose from the phone what we look at in terms of view. Like that. Really simple soft, free software. Um, you can get it as a um, a paid upgrade to a professional version, which gives you more. But what I'm working with is the free version, and it's really good and really clever. Right, that is pretty well the end of garage tour because there isn't a great deal to see you know, i'm in a five meter by um three meter garage and i get anything else in i'm full the the workbenches i have are full i don't have much space um lots of, it would be nice to have machines out in the middle of the floor so you can walk around them but as soon as i do that i lose all the floor space i have got so everything has to be pushed back to the wall. Um, part of the penalty of being in a small workshop. I mean, those that we've seen, they've got workshops which are 20 metres by 30, by 10 metres, and they pick them up with a crane to move them and that sort of thing. I, it's not available to, to do that myself. I, I don't need a rack on the wall that carries 15 or 20 chucks, Phil. Um, I have to get away with one or two jugs, um, and I do fine. Um, so there we are. That's that is the space that I've got. Uh, a lot of people say, "Do you convert timber?" No, I don't, because I've got nowhere to put it. Um, uh, it's a shame, um, but with the sort of work I do. 
it's all in effect paid for and timber is just bought in as and when i need it um the amount of timber i store is almost nil i've got a, a small number of uh, turning blanks under the bench i've got a supply of timber down the far end which supports the work i do with saucepans and, and pan handles is one of the main things that i do these days um and that's it um i survive and i i work from from here um getting 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 goods in as and when i need them right that is pretty well the end of the tour i've got quite a lot of bits and pieces i can show you you got any questions at the moment about uh, paul Hello. Hang on. Yeah, sorry, I think I was on mute then. Um, yeah, the question on drum sander. Um, how much thickness can you remove on each pass with the drum sander as opposed to a, a thicknesser? Um, I have no problem taking off half a mil quite often what i do is i cut the timber to the size i require close close enough and then just take it down in two or three passes like a, maybe a third of a mill at a time but i, I could it depends on the hardness of the timber obviously if it's pine or something real soft you can take one or two mil um <coughs> it's, the, the drum is turning i think at 1400 and I only ever run with 80 grit paper on it. Um, it's, uh, you have to be careful if, you, if you're using real hard timber. A lot of the stuff that I sand is oak. And I can show you some of that in a little while. Um, Even if you wanted to sort of take, take stock off faster, you just use a course of grit? Would you? Uh, potentially, yes, you could. Personally, I would cut it closer to size to, to what I wanted in the first place. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can't say because I haven't experienced that um, that way of working with it. Okay. Uh, another question. What is your PC software you're using? Uh, I'm on uh, Windows 10 on, on a laptop. Um, in sequence, I'm using... Touch portal, that's T O U C H hyphen portal to drive the Android phone uh, with buttons for scene selection. That is feeding into OBS, and OBS is feeding into Zoom. And everything is free. Your mic keeps fading out, John. Better better blame Martin Saban Smith because I got this on his recommendation. <laughs> okay. Um, another question. Can you just show those digital calipers again? Absolutely. I can remember which screen it's on. Yeah. How about that? Great. Uh, it is nothing more than a standard digital caliper. It's a, it's a six inch. Uh, I, it's made of plastic or carbon fiber. Um, it was less than four pound on eBay. And all of the measuring prongs are being cut off so that they don't present any sort of has inadvertent hazard because it's being used in and around moving machinery. Um, the only addition that I've done is the small angle bracket on the left hand end and it's drilled and screwed into the, the slider and there's magnet a couple of small magnets on the back of the, the main unit they sit on top of the um, tail stop and the angle bracket is set to the right length to just drop into the gap between the live center and the quill good idea there might be a few, few few people looking on eBay for calipers tonight. 
Yeah, it's it's a really simple idea. Yeah. Um, I the the one that I've shown you tonight, uh, well, the one that's on the screen now, um, that's for the big jet sixteen forty two. Uh, I've got another one uh, for the um, small Westminster lathe because the the like the, the the top thickness of the tailstock much less on the other lathe and the bracket needed to be shorter because it was just dragging on the quill and that uh, so that's the only difference you just have to make sure you can mount the unit on top of your tailstock and then fashion left hand end so that it just drops into the gap between the tailstock uh, between the quill and the revolving center without yep. dragging simple but effective yeah very ahead. simple very simple very effective and i use it dozens of times a week yeah, and, it yeah. and it costs you know it's throwaway money three pounds yeah. fifty or something like that okay yeah the amount of times i stick something in a hole to find out how deep i drilled yeah that would save a lot of that wouldn't it <laughs> Yeah, I'm quite happy to go into production if people want to buy them from me. They'll be fifteen ninety-nine. Checks in the post, John. <laughs> <laughs> if you want one, I'll make you one. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it, but it's, it is very simple. Yeah, there's a there's a, a statement on the question here about the drum sander. It says yeah, a lot of people think they can use the drum sander like a planer, but unfortunately, it knackers the drum. Yes. It's all yeah. You you uh, I I don't I t I and hard for a long time as to whether or not I wanted a, a planar thickness or or whatever, and I really couldn't justify it for a lot of the work that I do. Yeah. Um, and then I started to find out about the drum sander, and actually, it suited me down to the ground because I more often than not I cut material to the right sort of thickness within a mill for what I want. And then it's just two or three passes, top and bottom, and you get a perfectly finished piece. Yeah, good idea. Um, well, there's another comment there, the digital calipers. Um, there's something about a one-way lathe has a digital system built in. Okay. I know my one-way lathe certainly hasn't, but that's nearly 20 years old, so it, it yeah. might have uh, been a recent development. You know, this is the one that uh, I was showing you earlier. Yeah. If I can get it the right way up. You can see the bracket here. This is the height of the bracket that I've got on mine, and that just drops in between the quill and the uh, live centre. Yeah. Magnets on the back, so that just drops on top of the headstock and it gives you instant measurement. I mean, you can you can go to a, pl a point, you can zero it, and you can go another 10 mil or 20 mil or whatever. It's, you know, it's really flexible. It's as flexible as an as a ordinary digital caliper. Yeah. Anything else at the moment? Uh, no, just okay. uh, more, more chatter about the digital calibers and whether it's an option on one way or not. Uh, yeah, Kay, Kay says it is an option you can add to a one way. Well, um, if it is an option, I bet my option is cheaper. There's going to be more than £3.49 if it comes from one way though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, there's not a great deal else to show you in the workshop. Uh, you know. Um, Everything that you've seen is what I use every day. Um, I don't feel the need for anything else. What I would like to do now is tell you uh, a few anecdotes of things that I have witnessed and done at craft fairs. Uh, because an interesting sport. Um, now, I, w at one craft fair, my wife was selling from the display table like she was used to, and I was demonstrating with the little lathe in the corner next to the table. And a lady approached, um, 
elderly in years, maybe the same sort of age as us. Um, and she looked at the lathe and she looked at this end and she looked over the top. She, she pondered it from all sorts of angles like this. And she looked at me and she looked at the lathe again. And with some hesitation, she said, is it electric? And I said, yeah. And she said, hmm. And she walked away. Now that always intrigued me. So what she was thinking she was going to find out or what she was going to do with it. Interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> now, something which I did many times at a craft show and my wife always told me off that I can't help but do it. I'm sorry. And said, a customer's asked me, have you got any light bulbs? And um, yes, I said, yes, yes, yes. On the table, just, yeah. I pointed to two groups of pieces on the table. And she says, and I said to her, when you open your toilet door, bathroom door, whatever it is, you open the door, which side is the pull? Is it on the left or the right? And she said, oh, mm. it's on the right. I said, okay, fine. Ignore those over there. This is the pile you've got to look at because these are right-hand pulls. Those over there are for left-handed cord pulls. Oh, she said. She ferreted through, came up with two or three that she wanted and paid for them and went. Never said a word. And I just, I just, just wondered whether she ever thought back to that conversation and if she did, what did she think about it? But um, I often get into trouble for that sort of thing. Now, I'm going to put a picture on the screen, if I can find it. There. Now, we can all guess what it is. It's, I call it a baby mushroom. Now, drawing, there's a drawing pin there as well, so that you get a, a decent idea of what the scale is. The whole thing is no more than... 10, 12 mil tall, about six or seven, eight mil diameter, maybe. Um, I call them baby. Other people call them little trees. I've heard them called bonsai trees. I've heard them called table lamps. I don't care what they are. Uh, I call them my baby mushrooms. Now, when I used to be at a craft fair, I would keep an eye open for groups coming around the fair and quite often you'd see mom and dad dragging a couple of kids a couple of reluctant kids around and uh, I would often say to the children would you like me to make you something for free oh and the normal reply was oh yes please Mr. a bit of that so I proceeded to make them each a baby mushroom just like what you see there uh, no finesse, no sanding, no finishing. Part it off, put it in a bag. Each would take about 90 seconds of effort using true scrap wood. In the meantime, mum and dad cannot move on. They're hoving and puffing and blinding. They're getting agitated because they can't move on. And while they're standing, they're looking at the table. And all of a sudden, you see, oh, yes, yes. They've got the purse open. My wife has caught them. They've spent money. And then you give the kids their little mushrooms and let them go. And mum and dad are completely happy. They've moved on. They've spent money. And their kids have got a free present. It's the sort of thing that uh, Martin Clarkson was talking about on Tuesday. He likes to still fade in and out, John. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got it. I, I don't know what I can do to help you. We are completely linked. I'll try and stand still and stand close. No. Anyway, yes, Martin Clarkson was um, saying on Tuesday night, if you can give something to somebody for free, they'll always come as a, a good customer. Uh, quite often they come back as a customer. Um, I found it very, very valuable to just do this little trick 
because so these little mushrooms have earned to me hundreds of pounds and they cost nothing to make and they're quick and easy and it's just good business right let's get back off that come back to that right in the past uh, lots of uh, craft goods have been created and they've all been made just in case I could sell them. While I, I used to be employed at Siemens in Wellingborough and I was taught that just in case is a waste of time, a waste of effort and a waste of money. Whether or not others agree with this is a different matter. It doesn't matter to me, but you know, that's the way uh, business is sometimes. Uh, I was told that it's much more realistic and profitable to make stuff in time, not just in case. So you don't have cupboards full of stock that may or may not um, deteriorate. Um, everything that you produce and pass on and sell is brand new and up to date and uh, in good condition. And it was, the ch it was the way that I chose to go with the business side of what I do. Um, so I have completely moved away from spending out endless hours making stuff that I might sell one day. And now I very rarely do a craft show. All my sales leads come directly from my website. It also has a section dedicated to projects. And that section has freely downloadable files describing all sorts of processes I have developed over the years. Um, no particular person inspires me. I just tend to spot things that I like or things that involve an inherent challenge because that does seem to be the way my wood turning has gone. It has always seemed to involve a challenge in some way. Um, having found a challenge, I spend time looking for a solution which is, in effect, effective and usable. Typical of this is an item that I call a bendy bottle. Now, if I can find the right picture, we look at that glassware. Um, I saw this glassware in a craft gallery in Perth, Western Australia, a couple of years ago. Uh, having seen it, I was totally captivated by it. I just loved it. I spent ages looking at the stuff and I got hold of a tape measure. I was measuring things. Um, it was just, I was captivated by it. There's no other word. Uh, it's produced by a guy called Hamish Donaldson under the name Sloopy. Um, and I came away from that gallery with a clear intention of sorting out how am I going to reproduce that concept in wood? It's not, I wonder if I could or do you think I ever will? The intention was there immediate and it was all a matter of solving the challenge of how you create that in wood. Um, now if I go to that picture, you can see there a, a bottle form uh, on the lathe. Now from headstock to tailstock, that's 500 mil in the top picture. Uh, the, the bottle section, I've tried to keep it entirely as a bottle because that was, th that was the way I wanted it to present. I wanted it to show as a bottle um, with a convoluted neck and flute. In the bottom half of that picture, you can see how I've cut the entire neck section into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, 14 pieces, including the, the trumpet head. Um, now, when I have done that, as you can see, 
uh, I sand each of the pieces into a wedge shape in a very carefully controlled orientation. And all of the sandings are done following a marked spiral. So it's not a true wedge. It, sanding top, sanding bottom is slightly offset. <clears throat> and you get pieces like this. Now, I'm satisfied with those. Um, the bottle on the left is the one that you saw on the lathe. Um, that now measures 400 mil um, bottom to top, whereas on the lathe it was 500 mil. So I had lost four inches of height. The two in the middle, um, they're just all ones. They both came from a 12 inch blank. And they finished up at about nine inch tall, uh, as did the two on the right, actually, uh, both small ones from a 12 inch blank. Um, I, I'm happy with them. Um, if anybody wants to wants me to discuss the process any further, I'm more than happy to do so at this stage. You there, Paul? Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions yet? Uh, nothing at the moment. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, uh, this is typical of the sort of thing that I do. Um, I, I see something I'd like. I enjoy the challenge of trying to decide how I'm going to deal with it. And then I enjoy the challenge of actually creating the piece. And that is what I made for me. Um, the essence of what it started off is that is, is still there as far as I'm concerned. I, I accept that the base is completely different. Um, difficult to know how you would do something like that in a wood turning without it being a, a carving. So I opted for a, a standard shape, perfectly round, straight bottle with a convoluted neck um, and in actual fact to do it you divide the the top end into your segment width um, and then you put a spiral I mean I've seen you Paul doing spirals on your um, goblets yeah this is no different it's you start with a, a cotton thread at a given point at the bottom and you give it about one or one and a half turns around the entire neck when you finish at the top. Um, so you've got a, a one and a half turn spiral up the height of the neck. Wherever the cotton crosses um, a segment cut line, you put a mark. And all of the sanding process that creates the convoluted shape is done with those um, spiral marks as registration points. And then you glue them together and away you go and you finish up with, there's a lot of hand sanding and a lot of, I, I use coarse files and, and not so coarse files and then a lot of hand sand because you've got to get rid of all the lumps and bumps as you go. Um, and then it's sort of uh, hand finished all the way. The The, the colored pieces here, that's spray paint on top of sanding sealer. Um, and then two or three coats of acrylic lacquer. Uh, the one on the left, is, it doesn't quite show the, the real color there. Um, I'll try and show it if my camera is gonna behave itself. Oh, I'll, I'll hang on a minute. This is that piece. You can see it's, a, it's an iridescent green, dark, very dark. It started with a couple of coats of dark blue paint, to give it a good base. And then I over, over sprayed it with a couple of very fine mist coats of um, metallic green. And it's just car paint. Uh, the trumpet end was well and truly masked to keep it clean and, and paint free. Finished properly on the bottom. 
and it just stands there looking like a good one. I love them. Right, that's the bendy bottles. It's very typical of the sort of thing that I enjoy. Now, a large proportion of the work I do is saucepan handles. Um, people will say, oh, boy, what a silly game that is. Question on your bottles before you move on, John. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Do you consider keeping a hole in the middle of the neck? Yes. Yes, there is, there is a hole that runs through. Um, as I sand each piece, or before I sand each piece, I put a hole in the centre. Not a big one, an eighth, an eighth diameter, two or three mil. And the, when you glue the pieces together, the glue goes up the hole and down the hole. Um, gives it real good strength. Uh, I, I haven't considered putting a hole through it like you would a holoform. Okay. So, um, on the on this piece, you can see there is still the the tiny divot in there. That's from the live center. I I I didn't bother taking it out. But it, it's it's not a hollow form. It's solid. Uh, uh, but yet yeah, there is a hole that runs right through the neck. But it's drilled as as I as you go building it up. Um, and it's very good for making sure that the glue joints stay glued. And a question on how do you glue and clamp the pieces together? Gluing is very easy. That's the glue. No clamping involved. You just glue top glue bottom put it in place and make sure the registration marks that are on the outside are, are together so that the pattern follows um hold it for a few seconds and that'll be it and by the time i've then picked up the next piece and sanded it top and bottom because the pieces you know they're cylindrical pieces if you sand them into a wedge you get that but actually you sand them like that so that the, the sanding on the top does not necessarily match the sanding on the bottom because there is a registration line that goes up the neck and you use the registration points on the top and the bottom of the piece to be your, your target low point. Now, you pick up a piece, you sand the bottom, you sand the top, you drill a hole through it, and by the time you've done that and put glue on it, the bottle is strong enough to take the next piece already. And you just put it in place, lines up carefully, hold it for a few seconds, clean the glue joint as, as best you can with a bit of damp tissue. And as soon as you can feel you can let it go, which is maybe 30 seconds at the most, uh, you can then move on to the next piece. The, um, the bottle that I've shown you, I probably built it from bottom to top in an hour and a half. And then I leave it overnight before I start trying to do any hand sanding and hand finishing. Okay, great. Do you have a website? Yes. Uh, hang on just a moment. How about that? All right, thanks, John. Long enough? <laughs> well, the, the mushroom picture was in the same gallery scene as my introduction page. I just brought the picture to the front. I, I've run out of uh, buttons on my uh, touch portal device. Yeah. Very flexible software. Anything else? Uh, no, don't think I've got any other questions. Okay. 
Right, I was saying earlier that a large proportion of the work I do, I'm going to avoid using the, the mobile camera. A large proportion of what I do is saucepan handles. Um, to a lot of people, it's silly and pointless. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it, it fills my time admirably. Now, I've today, today Friday, I've had four orders, and that's uh, for something like twenty handles and and um, lid knobs for the saucepan lids. As far as I'm concerned, it's not a silly game. It's all good business, and I enjoy it. It's an odd one, but I enjoy it. So you can't say much about it, can you? And it, and, it, and it makes me good money. I can genuinely say that, well, I mentioned that we went to Australia a couple of years ago. That trip, including the flights and the accommodation and car hire for a month, the entire trip was paid for by panhandles. So don't let anyone put it down. It's good business. And I, I enjoy it. This is a Le Creusier pan. This is a handle that I've put on, a replacement. Um, I see all sorts of problems with this type of pan. Um, it's got an aluminium loop at the back end, a steel ring at the front end, a steel rod through the middle. Um, people put them in dishwashers and they expect them to survive. They don't. Thank you very much. Um, as far as I'm concerned, when Le Creusier and Prestige designed their saucepans with wooden handles, uh, that put me into business for the rest of my life. I, you know, it's, it's an excellent business decision by them as far as I'm concerned. I think for the users, it's absolute crap. This is another one, different style. Um, this is typical of the sort of handle that would be on it normally. This is typical of the state of play that I get sent. Uh, more often than not, I don't need people to send me handles now because I've seen all the common ones and I've got all the dimensions. And I just say, what style is it? Oh, I don't know. Well, send me some pictures. And I say, oh, okay. I just say, send me some pictures, and I can very often tell straight away what it is. This is something that you know, completely lacquered. I think this one was chewed by a dog just here. But you, know, you can see on this steel bolt through the middle, it, I think it's probably been in a dishwasher. It's in the process of rusting through. I can replace bolts, I can manufacture bolts. Um, depending on the style, I can remanufacture the metal ferrules. Um, certainly Le Creusier, these pans, the, the metal rod in there, which is actually fixed to the pan, very often breaks, especially when you try and take it apart. Um, that's good, all good news for me because I, I can then take the pan i can drill out the rod this is where the the myford lathe comes in i can drill the rod out of the pan and i can drill the rod out of the loop at the end replace it with nickel nickel plated um, steel threaded studding and uh, regenerate it completely with a handle which is universal For me, it's an excellent business to be in because it, it doesn't need you to get into production quantities. I only make what I sell. I, I make nothing until it's sold uh, and, and money in the bank. Um, it's quirky, it's odd, but it's interesting. Um, as I say, in, in the main, I need to... 
I need to thank the two companies, Le Creusier and Prestige. They make excellent saucepans and they've put wooden handles on them for use on gas and electric cookers. Decision which is guaranteed to keep me going. Um, the story started uh, several years ago. A friend said, could you make me a couple of these for my Le Creusier pants? I'd never seen a saucepan handle before that. And I looked at it. I wondered how to make it. Um, it's it's a, it's an odd one because it, I hadn't until then appreciated that you can either put a piece of wood in the lathe and you can shape it, or you can drill a hole through it and then mount it. Uh, and pan handles, you have to drill the hole through first because it's very important that the turning is concentric with the the hole through the middle. And as soon as you try and drill a hole through wood, we all know it can go where it chooses occasionally. Um, so the last thing you want to do is drill the hole after you've made the handle. Um, so that's that. Uh, now, something else that I do a great deal of, if I can show you some more pictures. Is that not that one? That one. Banjo hoops. Um, I manufacture a banjo hoop for a guy in Norfolk. Uh, I don't have to make the banjo in any way, shape or form. I just make the hoop because the hoop is the body of the, of the instrument. You can see on the left there that there's a baseboard with a thin layer of mahogany, mahogany laid down and then one, two, three rings, two oak and one mahogany. Now those rings, I will cut them to about, well, the timber is about 21 mil thick. And I will use the drum sander to take it down to 19 mil. Uh, so I will take one mil off both sides, top and bottom. Um, and that becomes a finished ring ready for assembly. On the right, you can see the the whole glued up assembly up on the lathe and ready for turning. Um, it's You turn it in exactly the same way as you would a hollow form, except that it's absolutely essential. You keep the, the inside and the outside straight and parallel. Um, when you have got everything to the right size, uh, the outside diameter is absolutely crucial and then the, the inside diameter is half an inch less less so the finished piece is half an inch thick um, when everything is done and shaped you just part it off um, below the fifth layer if you if you look on the left picture the, the you can see the top layer of ebony followed by oak mahogany oak and mahogany which has been stuck down onto the baseboard. I, you, the finished article is parted off below the fifth level, uh, leaving the baseboard free for the next hoop. And that is typical of the finished product. This is, I do no more to them than this. Uh, they're well sanded to the right size. Uh, there's no finishing applied other than sanding sealer. Uh, the one on the left is typical of what I normally do. Uh, the one on the right was um, a special series where there was a recess cut in the top to take a rolled brass tone ring. Um, again, it was an interesting challenge to figure out how to make them. The lead came from a banjo maker uh, and he had seen my website and uh, he just emailed me and said, "Can you have you ever made a banjo hoop? I said, no. Oh. Uh, and this is completely typical of what I'm doing. I do at least one a month of these and they cost a lot of money, give me good income.
So it's, it's ebony at the top, and on this line, this level, we've got oak, mahogany, oak, and then a thin trim ring at the bottom. And when it's on the lathe, you turn the outside to the right diameter, you turn the inside to the right diameter, you finish the face, and then you part in. Let me guess if I can get this one. Right. That point. I work with a light on on the inside, and you part in until you get the, the nice yellow bright light, and you don't go any further. Mm -hmm. Having got a bright white light in the parting gap, uh, you then cut it off with a, with a, a saw blade, because by then it's only a millimeter thick. If like if uh, I reverse chuck the piece. I've got typical sort of cold jaws. Uh, these discs I've made so that I can, there wasn't quite enough diameter on, on my cold jaw set. Uh, so I put these discs on. And these are door stops, rubber door stops, because the little buttons that you normally get on a cold jaw, they weren't big enough to hold the hoop. And mm -hmm. When this is on the, the cold drawer is on the lathe, I can hold that really quite safely because I get an inch of projection inside the hoop with the, the big rubber door stops. And that then allows you to finish the back edge. So that is um, typical of the sort of thing that I do regular. Another line that I do enjoy is segmentation in general. Now, this is typical of, of something that I enjoy doing. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not, but the number of segments on this circle is 15. Now, I was told and taught that you only ever make segmented pieces with an even number of segments. And that's so that you can build two half rings and then sand the edges so they fit nicely and glue them together. I didn't like that as a restriction. For me, it was a problem and a challenge to be solved. Now this is just as typical. I think there's nine on this. No, 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 this is wrong. This is, this is an eight segment. I do love the patterns that you can get like this. This, as you can see, it's it's got five five flutes around it, uh, and it's one dark segment and two light segments. Five times three is fifteen, and I make it as a complete ring in exactly the same as I would a banjo hoop. And when all the rings are built, you then stack them up. And those where they've got a spiral in them, um, you just have to index maybe half a or half or one third of a um, segment each time in the right right direction, and finish up with an interesting pattern like that. Uh, Something that I've done in the past, uh, standard fruit, nothing very exciting. Um, now, a few years ago, uh, my wife and I hosted Sue Harker because she was doing a local demonstration. And at the time, I was quite into uh, the sort of work Sue Harker did and I looked at her website and I saw something um, that I quite liked. Now at the time I was looking for something that I could create in a club demonstration um, that was different and I came up with this. Okay it's an apple. I think very remarkable there. 
it's a pierced apple. It's segmented in the middle. On the lathe, it's made oak top, uh, bottom and top. Uh, there's three layers of segments in the middle there. They are about eight mil thick. And there are gaps. Now I make this on um, an index wheel during a club demonstration. And so far as I know, I've never known anyone who go to a complete finished piece using segmentation in a club demo. Um, so for me, it was, it was really something quite different. Now this piece, it is a plastic bung in the bottom. These are from salt cellars. These from a company in Ireland. Um, so the whole piece is drilled about 20 mil diameter, I think it is, from bottom, from bottom to the top of the pigment layers, and no further. Otherwise, you tend to come through the crown. You don't want more. Um, and having drilled it, you recess the bottom in the right way, and you put a put a, a bung in, and it becomes a potpourri. Or you can put um, cotton wool in there and some scented oil. Makes a nice thing. Uh, now, if I find some uh, one or two more pictures. Now, on the left, you can see a Singapore ball. Now, I saw these being made by Bob Tuckman a few years ago, a uh, well-renowned Turner. And later, I saw David, David, David Springer doing the same sort of thing. And again, I was captivated by it. Uh, it seemed horribly complicated. Um, I got David Springett's book and I read the section very carefully on how he makes them and he made it sound complicated. I, I analyzed it very carefully to work out what was the minimum special tooling you could get away with um, to make one. And it actually came down to a single special chisel and a cradle to hold the ball while you make the holes in it. And from that point onwards, it became a bit of a tedious task to make them. Um, I never stock them. I only ever make them to order. And as it happens, I've had an order this week for one of those. You know, on a craft table, um, it would be a focal point. And people would say, oh, that looks nice. Can I pick it up? Yes, you carry on. Um, and they pick it up and they feel it and they love it. And they say, oh, I've got to have one of those. How much is it? And you say, oh, it's about 85 pound. Ooh, and they put it down very quick because people simply don't want to pay that sort of money at a craft table. However, if you extrapolate the ideas carefully, you can come up with something like you see on the right hand side. And now I've called it a Singapore stick, of a Singapore ball. There's a, there's a single teardrop in both ends. Uh, I made that piece this week uh, just so that I'd got some. I could show the picture tonight and I can make that in half an hour or so. Uh, it's a very simple um, spindle turning for the center uh, and then drill both ends because it's a, it's a straight spindle. Um, you can hold it very carefully in a pin chuck. I tend to put this sort of thing inside a length, a short length of plastic pipe with a slot net and then grip down on the um, the pipe with the jaws and that captures the piece inside and you can turn it quite safely and drill it out and fit and hollow the ends and then make the pins and put them in. Uh, so one piece, two pins, about less than half an hour's work maybe and they sell easily. Uh, people are more than happy to buy those rather than the ball. And again, I've, I've managed to sell quite a lot of those. 
um, making the ball for the Singapore ball, that in itself had a huge challenge um, because that sent me on a path which took several years to solve uh, as how to make a ball. Now, I've tried all sorts of jigs and templates and whatever. Uh, I was never happy with any of them, especially not the cost of jigs. They're extortionate for what they are. But at the same time, you know, it's a market for some people. Uh, I won't buy them. Uh, instead, I put uh, my mathematical uh, history into use. And I came up with a formula that allowed you to calculate how to define the shape of a ball. Now, if you look on my website in the projects pages, you'll find the instructions on how to make a ball. And it's deadly accurate. And it's something that I've done in club demonstrations uh, several times. Um, and it's very simple. So you can make an accurate ball without having to worry about Am I going to get it round? Because you will every time. Uh, the very final thing I'm going to show tonight. Now, I can absolutely guarantee to you, to everybody, that the photo you're going to see was taken six o'clock. So that's two and a half hours ago. Now, that is our cat tonight she decided this is where I'm gonna sleep and that happens to be my wife's favorite fruit bowl it was the first presentable piece that I made when I started turning in 2007-2008 it was the first major piece that I made it stayed in one piece it's enjoyed by all the family my wife loves it I love it clearly the cat loves it and that's it. Thanks, John. I've got a couple more questions for you. Okay. Um, going back to the pan handles, what finish do you use on them? Um, sanding sealer and hard glaze varnish. Normally two coats of varnish, uh, 24 hours between each coat. Uh, you have to appreciate it is not a piece of fine turning. It's not a gallery piece. It's going to live its life in a cupboard. Yeah. Knocked and bashed and banged. It has to be hard wearing. And I do nothing other than sanding sealer on the lathe. And then all the stuff goes in the house. And it gets um, at least one, if not two, maybe three coats of varnish. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah. Next question. Um, yep. Well, uh, not sure if it's a question or not. Um, someone's questioning: Could they return in acrylic or some sort of heat-resistant plastic? What the handles? Yeah. Um, I guess so. I've not tried it. Yeah. I mean, my the handles that I produce will burn and crack in exactly the same way as the, the original handle from the manufacturer. And I'm more than happy for my customers to come back to me for replacements. Yeah. Uh, okay. I've not tried it. Quite possibly you could. Hmm. Um, and someone else has asked, do, do the, the saucepan makers not sell replacement handles? No. Okay. Oh, Le, Le Creuset do. I think they charge £40 each. Right. Uh, Prestige um, is a name which we all know in the UK anyway, um, but that company uh, failed many years ago and was taken over and was taken over again. And it's now the, the, the company name is owned by the Mayer Group, I think it is, or the Mayer Group. And when you ring their customer services and they say, you, if you say, and you give me a handle, and I say, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, on, on this, these pans, show you, top or bottom, 
stainless steel, excellent saucepans. Many, many people have had these as wedding presents 20, 30, 40 years ago. And now I am reaping the benefit of replacing all the handles for them. And in 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 years, they might want to come back for some more. I'm still turning, I'll make them. Okay, question on the banjo rings. Do you use the same, always use the same number of segments? Um, the number of segments in the ring is irrelevant as far as the customer is concerned. He doesn't care as long as it looks good to finish with. Um, so yes, I use the same number of segments. I've gone for 12. Um, I, I tried one with eight segments and I got an awful lot of short grain on the edges and uh, difficult to sand. Um, so I went up to 12 segments. Um, I could go to, oh, oh, I was told it's got to be an even number of segments for some reason. I don't know why. Um, I, I did ask, did it matter? Um, so I, I went to 12. I could have gone to 16 had I felt the need. Um, I do find that if I get the get the hoop with eight segments, these the pieces were uh, sort of that long, and you got a, a lot of very short open grain at the ends, and they're difficult to sand. And you have to appreciate that when you're sanding with ebony, you're getting black dust and dirt. Um, some of the hoops I make have got ebony top and bottom. These have got mahogany at the bottom. Some have ebony top and bottom. And with that amount of ebony, the last thing you want is dust entering the wood. It's very difficult to get it out. And eight segment was no good because it gave you a lot of open grain at the end of each segment. So I moved on to 12 segment and I get what I believe to be an acceptable response, um, result. I mean, there is no tear out anywhere because most of what you're turning is side grain. And you can, there you can see the inside. Um, a nice fine finish. And my customer is completely happy. And he says they are probably the best hoop that he has seen in many years, especially coming from someone who is supposedly an amateur turner. I mean, I am just an amateur turner who happens to make a bit of money. I mean, we would all like to be there. Um, I can't make money like Martin Clarkson can because he is supporting his wife and family. I am supplementing my pension. And in actual fact, um, the wood turning I do pays more than some of my pensions. It's all down to stuff like this. And I do at least one of these a month. They cost hundreds. Great. Thanks, John. I think that's all the questions. A um, few comments. Um, one says beautiful banjos. One Lovely. Says, fascinating and inspirational. Um, Good. Another one that says thanks for the great tour. And um, another one that says they've enjoyed it. So, Good. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, 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 I, what I did want to try and get across tonight was the, the sort of work that anybody can do in a confined space. I mean, I, I've got more space here than a lot of amateur turners. Um, my my work, workshop is 15 square metres. Um, I mean, we saw a tour in America last, last week or the week before and the workshop was hundreds of square meters, wasn't it? Hmm. Yeah. I can't remember the lady's name. Oh, was that Loopy? Yes, it. Loopy. Yeah, yeah. Loopy, Loopy, whatever her name was. Fine. Okay. If that's the space that she's got to work with, good luck to her. Um, we have to keep it realistic. And this is the sort of environment that a lot of people are dealing with. Um, now, I know of one colleague who can't turn in the winter because he's in his garage and it's cold. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, six months of the year, he does no turning. I, I, I turn 
every day, probably in the year. Uh, I've got one small heater down just at the side of me. It's not on at the moment. Um, and this wall, this back wall here, uh, is straight out onto the garden, and it's just single brick. This is the cold end of the garage. Um, on the on that side, I've got a um, party wall into another garage. This side is the house. The roof is heavily insulated. The floor, I'm standing on a raised floor. I think it's four inches high, four inch timber with 18 mil plywood. Uh, the front wall is an up and over door, which has been sealed and ins insulated inside and out because where the up and over door was on the outside, cladding, heat UPVC cladding, and that's insulated in, in between it and the door. And there's about six inches of insulation there. And then it's sheeted over with plywood. So, you know, I'm well sealed in <coughs> um, to the extent that it can get pretty hot in here in the, in the summer. Quite often I open my workshop door, I open the front door of the house, and I open the window here, and I get a nice draft through. And, and that does actually clear the workshop of any dust. Great. Thanks, John. Th thanks for organising your workshop and tidying up for us and uh, doing it. Is a, it's a lot cleaner than a lot of scene. <laughs> uh, some of my colleagues have seen the workshop in its best state and its worst state. And tonight it's pretty decent. Good. I'll, I'll unmute everybody else and they can uh, participate in the chat now. Okay. I'll... OBS to Zoom. Uh, and I can see people then. If anybody's got any particular questions, I'm more than happy to field them as they come up. John, do you use a jig? Yeah, if anyone's got any questions, you can you can pitch in yourselves or anything else you want to chat about. It's uh, just an open forum now. But you, you'll have to unmute yourself though. But you should be able to do that now. John, John Fryers can't get into the meeting. He's been trying. He apologises. Well, that's just not good enough. <laughs> Call himself a chairman. Oh. <laughs> Do you use a jig? Do I use a jig for for your segments? No. Your segments. No. Um, I cut them on the bandsaw to close to correct length and c close to the correct angle. And I've got just an ordinary jig on the on the standing table set to precisely the right angle and then that is good enough for me yeah, one, one, one of the things I can show you this is the baseboard that I will build a hoop on as you can see it's got uh, it, it's 18 mil ply on top of that is what I call a sacrificial layer, which is just pine. And that is made on, oh, going back to the last question. Yes, I, I build the, the segment rings on a very carefully annotated diagram, which is actually, I suppose, a jig. I can show that. This is a piece of kitchen worktop. Okay, it's got 12 sided for convenience, big hole in the middle. Uh, the segment markers are, are marked on there. That is laid out on there. And that is my building pattern for a ring. Uh, it, this has been marked up for 11 inch hoops and 12 inch hoops on, an, on a 12 inch hoop. I go by the outermost line 
and the third line. For an 11 inch hoop, I go by that line and that line. Now, if you can careful, you can probably see the circles drawn on, which show where the actual hoop will be. And as so long as you cover that area of timber, that area of the diagram with your timber, then the hoop will be okay. So that's, that's what I build the hoops on. And this sacrificial ring was built on one of those patterns. And it's very carefully centered on the baseboard. Then they're stacked up, indexed together so they can't move. And it's all glued into a single wedge, wodge, not wedge, and uh, then turned. Uh, turning day to make the hoop, I always find it, ner I get nervous on those days because you're working inside a big piece running at a lot of RPM. Um, and if you have a bad catch of any sort, it's going to cost you an entire hoop, maybe. And one day last year, I had a really bad catch with a with a hole gouge, and it cost me an inverter for my lathe. So that was, I think, seven hundred pounds, just from one catch. Painful. Painful. Uh, I I think. Uh, from about 1600 RPM, um, the bowl goes just caught in something and it stalled the lathe momentarily. And I think the amount of current that shot back into the um, inverter, it just blew it up. And it went back to Axminster and they charged me hundreds. So, it's mm. Anybody want to see any of the pictures again for any reason? Well, I guess not. No, okay. Okay. Thank you very much, John. That's uh, an interesting session. And uh, I think okay. I might go and find myself a... Go get yourself a digital caliper. Uh, like a, a, a textbook adapter. Yeah. Um, okay. Muted up. A lot of the people are still muted up on the screen. I, I am muted myself to speak to you. And I think everybody else is still muted up. Like. Yeah, the, the range of work that I do at the moment is actually quite narrow. Um, and principally, this is because. I don't make anything that's not paid for. Um, it's not the way some people want to work. People want to, maybe people want to work with freedom of mind to play and do whatever they want. Uh, I'm happy doing what I do. And at the same time, it gives me, I'm, I'm, I'm content with that. Uh, quite often I will find something that I say, oh, I wouldn't mind having a go at that. And then it gets written down on the sheet uh, in my memory book, and I, I perhaps make a few drawings and things. And at some time in the future, I will come to all these pieces and I will make. But at the same time, it's when I've got time. 